Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to the theoretical physics session of the undergraduate symposium. So this session I'll just um, be mentioning some general instructions and then I'll hand over to the chair. Uh, so for some general instructions, uh, please keep your audio and video turned off because that saves some bandwidth. And also note that each session in the symposium is um, each talk is of 15 minutes length. So where the first 12 minutes is for the talk itself and the last three minutes is for the question answer session. So we will take questions during the question answer session and uh, you can also raise your hands. So one another announcement that is we also have some posters on our channel, our precision channel. So you can view the posters here and you can also add your queries or comments and, uh, to the author. Um, so um, that's it. And this session is being chaired by Pratu Shabha So over to Pratu Shabha Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the second session of the day. So this session has four talks, each of 12 minutes in length. So the first talk is by Shourav from IIT Delhi. He will talk about theory independent tests of GR by analyzing black hole images over to Shoulder. So you can start sharing. Hello, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I, I need to uh, make a small correction. I'm not from IIT Delhi, I'm from University of Delhi. So, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry, no sorry. So I hope my screen is visible now. Yeah, thank your you. screen is visible. Okay, great. So very good afternoon to uh, everyone present here. My name is Saurav and I am I just re I recently graduated from the Housing College University of Delhi. So today's talk um, will be based on theory independent test of general relativity by analyzing black hole images. And this work, uh, this work supervisor is Dr. Saurav Nampalivar from University of Tübingen, Germany. Okay, so the basic outline for this talk is uh, first I'll be discussing a basics and some uh, introduction, which will outlay the background of my work. Then I'll discuss the basic procedure, the recipes, uh, the proposal that we are proposing. And then I'll be discussing some of our uh, preliminary results that we have found using uh, numerical and theoretical simulations for. So let's just uh, get started. It, it all started in back in 1915 when um, Professor Albert Einstein gave his theory of general relativity. We described how space time is actually curved when there is some mass in space time. The theory of relativity describes how um, gravitation is actually is in its um, purest form. And uh, it, it's a purely theoretical, um, no, pure theoretical concept where he described how space time actually gets curved when uh, there's a particle or there's some gravitational mass. Now, after in 1915, uh, in 1916, Carl Schwarzschild, uh, he found the first uh, solution of Einstein field equations, which were proposed by Einstein. And it actually described a very simple a static and a spherically symmetric black hole. In 63, uh, almost after 47 years, Roy Kerr gave a rotating solution of those uh, black hole, uh, rotating solution of those Einstein field equations we described nothing but a rotating form of that Schwarzschild black hole, which means the black hole which is having some angular momentum. And in 65, we finally got another solution, which was Kerr Neumann solution, which was given uh, by Neumann by adding nothing but a charge to that um, rotating black hole, which giving us um, an, another solution. So almost for uh, many, many decades, we just had three uh, solutions of black holes, which were uh, explaining how space time is actually is and and what other different uh, exotic objects that can be presented in our universe. Now dwelling into um, uh, basic black hole physics, uh, we cannot go until we are done with some basic uh, mathematical jargon. So here are very few, uh, very basic things that I need to discuss. The first is uh, the space time geometry. So those who are uh, who have done a bit of special relativity might know this particular form, which is nothing but a tensorial form of a line element, which is this, which describes nothing but a space time, which is simply a metric that we call, which is described by a very simple 
uh, <clears throat> expression uh, where G menu is a metric tensor, which describes the space time. Another one is the geodesic equation, a uh, very famous equation, which tells us how matter moves around in that particular space time. And quoting um, <clears throat> Professor Wheeler, he said that uh, uh, a space time tells matter how to curve and matter tells space time how to uh, curve. So that's, that's the basic, um, uh, that's the basic uh, quote that he gave based on uh, Einstein's theory. And this is a geodesic equation, which beautifully explains those statements. And finally, uh, we have Einstein field equations, which tells us how actually the space time is curved <clears throat> where there is some sort of matter. So left, si left hand side actually describes the space time geometry, which is nothing but in geometrical aspects. And the right hand side describes the matter part, which is uh, T menu. So the main part of general relativity uh, is for many years has been to solve these equations and to find as many solutions as possible. And these equations is Schwarzschild black hole curve, black hole curve, Newman black hole. These are nothing but the solutions of these uh, set of um, nonlinear partial differential equations. So uh, these solutions which we have, this Schwarzschild black hole and curl black hole, these solutions are basically vacuum solutions. This means that there is no matter present. So for these uh, solutions to be in vacuum, D mini has to be zero, which means there has to be no matter part. Okay, so directly jumping on to um, the black hole space times here, we are, I have listed just two uh, important space times that <clears throat> uh, uh, we normally use. First is a very simple static and spherically symmetric black hole, which is Schwarzschild metric and Kerr metric, which is a black hole uh, describing a rotating space time. So here A is actually a, is actually called the spin parameter where it describes um, how space time is uh, uh, of a black hole is rotating and it is actually uh, proportional to uh, uh, angular momentum. Now, after many years, um, there was this very basic theorem called no hair theorem, which actually states that the property of a black hole can be characterized by only three uh, properties, which were uh, referred to as hairs, basically one which of is mass, second is angular momentum, and the third one is charge. So for our work, we basically uh, neglect charge. We do not take charge into that much effect, but we just take mass and angular momentum as these are the most important properties as of now. And this whole thing that I'm talking is in the realm of general relativity. So um, now I'll be talking about um, shadow formation, which is nothing but uh, a very beautiful concept that we were introduced to uh, last year by revelation of some of the amazing results led by Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, where they tried to image a very, very supermassive black hole uh, in the center of M87. And now that whole process of uh, what it was actually, I'm just going to describe it in a very short form and hope you'll understand it. So the first um, method is basically geodesics, understanding geodesics, which is nothing but the motion of uh, particles and photons around that particular space time. So um, in geodesics, we have something called normalization condition where the dot products uh, with a product of um, four velocities uh, is equal to zero for those of photons and for those of particles, it is actually equals to minus one. So null geodesics is known as the path of flight, which is basically photons and four velocity is nothing but four different components of the velocity. First of which is dependent on time, second one on the radial coordinate, then theta and then phi, which all are dependent on the thing on an affine parameter, which in case of photon is a lambda, which is just an affine parameter. And in case of a particle, it is obviously the proper time. Now, what we do is basically we do nothing. We just solve the, solve the geodesic equations for a given space time um, with this particular equation as we have G menu. We, this particular guy, it is actually dependent on this G menu. We solve this and we get uh, equations, four different equations for these four different guys. And then that's how we receive the four velocity. Now, um, anyone who knows the basic of calculus of variation and action principle would be able to understand the symmetries and basic conservation laws, which are nothing but uh, in case of simple uh, Schwarzschild black hole, we have energy and angular momentum, which is due to the symmetry in time and due to the axial symmetry respectively. So we solve the geodesic equations for simplicity, we are taking theta equals to pi by two, which means we are solving it in um, equatorial plane. And that's how we receive a simple and a beautiful energy equation. 
So this particular thing is called the energy equation where we have something called effective potential. Now in term of when we compare this particular equation with the Keplerian one, we have just one particular um, term which we see in here is extra, which actually gets to uh, the um, relativistic effects. And then that's how we see it. And that's how we talk about gravitational lensing that how uh, basically um, uh, we have a black hole and how when we are having a, a photon or let's say a ray of light, which is coming from infinity gets deflected when it gets, gets very pass, uh, when it's get very, very uh, near to that particular black hole. And that's the basic expression for a deflection angle, which is nothing but solving the four velocity for um, phi as a uh, relation with respect to the radial coordinate. So the shadow formation, how does it happen? It's a very interesting process. What we try to do is we try to um, see the effective potential if we are having some uh, maxima for that effective potential. Now, if there is some maxima for that effective potential, it actually constitutes to an unstable photon orbits and which actually uh, constitutes to a, a very interesting phenomena called photon sphere. And that actually gives us the boundary that uh, shadow might cast by that particular compact object. In case of social black hole, that boundary uh, this call the photon sphere is actually having 3m. There it is. Uh, here I've taken g and c equals to one in normal s coordinate. Otherwise, this is in the uh, units of uh, distance. So 3gm by c square. And g and c are actually um, behind the scenes. So, uh, and when we calculate the radius of the shadow, which means the actual uh, radius, the uh, shadow that we actually see when we are at infinity, it comes us uh, to be at three root three m, which is slightly larger than this photon sphere. And this is the all in the realm of null geodesics. In terms of accretion disk, uh, in terms of um, time like geodesics, we have inner stable circular orbits, which is R is co equals to six m, which is nothing but the same thing. So here's a simple, um, um, here's a simple uh, cartoon, which is actually showing how this uh, shadow formation works. You can see that we are actually uh, sort of firing photons in here from one particular direction and it's uh, going near the black hole. Some of the rays getting deflected, some of the get rays getting plunged in into the black hole and some of the rays are getting uh, scattered and very much less dis deflected as we are going far away from that black hole. So this particular orbit, which we see from which uh, the rays are getting deflected, it is uh, the critical orbit, which is says critical impact parameter and the one through which uh, there is this um, black black boundary, which constitutes to the uh, photon sphere of that black hole. Uh, you so, have two more minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here we actually uh, consider when we are talking about imaging a black hole, we actually consider a simple optically thin and radiating accretion flow, which is surrounding by that com uh, compact object given by this particular relation, which is nothing but a very simple relation for intensity in the image in the observer's plane. And the algorithm that we normally use is the uh, backward ray tracing algorithm, which, which is nothing but a very simple aspect where we shoot multiple parallel beams of light from the image plane, which means from the observer. And due to the defined some critical impact parameters, some rays get deflected, some rays get into, uh, some rays plunge into the singularity and some rays um, just uh, uh, turn around that particular photon sphere and gives us uh, infinite number of images. And then we do nothing. Uh, we numerically integrate all those intensities over this um, particular formula. And that's how we get a very beautiful image, which we have shared the shadow image. Here you can see I have, uh, we have fired photon from here. And just with a particular orbit, those rays which are not reaching the observer, that is the constituting the shadow part. So here, uh, this is a very basic social black hole. And this is the intensity, how the intensity is changing as respect to the impact parameter. And this is an example of a rotating black hole. So this is the first image that we got for the imaging of black hole were given by Jean Pierre Lemonet in 1979, where he considered a thin uh, optical uh, igniting disk. And that's the image that we have got. So um, uh, all that stuff was basically about the simulation and ray tracing and all that stuff. Now, my own work, what, our, what we do is basically we try to image this using Event Horizon Telescope. We try to image it using um, telescopes surrounded by Earth. And we, <clears throat> what exactly the result is, we get something like this. 
a very beautiful image of M87, which we got last year. So what exactly is happening in our work? We are taking a very generalized space-time metric as to uh, a very generalized metric in a particular theory, and then we are uh, having some emissivity profile. We retrace it using that simulation and produce some uh, images. Then after that, what we try to do is we use the uh, feature for radiant interferometry for synthetic BLBI observations using certain libraries, and then we use them as a source to get the image uh, reconstructed as a final image, something like this um, image, so that um, we see how realistic our simulations can be. And then we try to compare our data with the Event Horizon Telescope's uh, observations. And then we see that if we are actually deviating from the original solution of Kerr. So here we are actually trying to test general relativity in the most extreme way, where we are not just testing the space-time geometry using curved black hole, but we are testing it using a generalized metric so that uh, if we are having some uh, deviations from curve, we will be able to see that, or if there are no deviations from curve, that means the general relativity is successfully passing that particular test. <clears throat> so some of the uh, problems that we are facing is uh, degeneracy among parameters, which means that for multiple values, we might get um, uh, similar images as in, it's not just no theorem noise is falling here because here we are having multiple parameters which we see as deformation parameters and that is getting degeneracy in parameters. Computational cost, yeah, it is actually taking a lot of time when we are trying to simulate those images and then we're trying to work around using the parameter estimation using um, Bayesian analysis. Uh, that's one of the solutions for our work and then to compare our work with um, previous works and previous images, we use some standard metrics, uh, which is mean square error or uh, structure similarity index or structure dissimilarity index. So these are the results that we have found in, uh, in terms of our main work where we have tried to simulate rotating black hole and Schwarzschild black hole. And this is how we get how yet even as a telescope might see those um, images. If the ideal images, if the ideal source of black hole were to be this or to be this rotating black hole, which is surrounded by an optically thick accretion disk. Here we have taken nothing but the observer frequency as to be 22-27 gigahertz and the EHT array config is uh, 27 array, which was um, exactly the results which were being published last year. So here is the summary of our work, uh, a very basic summary. We take a generalized metric, take an emissivity profile, we retrace it, but then we have some simulated images. We have synthetic observations of radio interferometry, we convolve it, we get our synthetic images. Then we try to reconstruct those images using a certain algorithms, let it be MEMs or CHIRP or CLEAN. And then <clears throat> we have parameter estimation methods to find mass or the value of deformation parameter, possibly a parameter space. And then we finally see if we are having some deformations or some deviations from our original solution from the curved black hole. So yeah, thank you so much for attending. So thank you, Shogdab, for the wonderful talk. So if you have questions, you can raise your hand or type them in the chat box. We already have one question from Shagdek Mukherjee. I am reading it out. Okay. Do you take into account the detailed accretion disk structure geometry and the disk spectra, which is incident on the black hole? I mean, um. How sensitive are your mock simulations on the nature of accretion disk that might exist around the sensor engine? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, structure geometry. So we actually take the, um, um, uh, right now we are just taking very simple um, uh, emission model, which is the gas model here. Right now we are not using uh, accretion disk as in um, like the optical thin accretion. We have used it, but for our work for like the benchmark test, the result which I've shown, we have just taken a very simple accretion model, but um, uh, how sensitive are your mock simulations on the nature of accretion disk that might exist? Huh? So we are not testing the accretion disk, or we are not testing how sensitive, sensitive those accretion disks are. We're just using how uh, the pre-existing models of accretion disk and then simulating it using that. We consider that those, consider models, that are, those models are uh, explaining better the current scenario and the realistic situations. So, um, 
So, uh, I, hi, I'm Shadnik. Uh, so, just to build up on that, um, like uh, the Event Horizon papers, as far as I remember, tested around, uh, I don't know, like in some hundred or more accretion models just based on uh, the black hole images, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, there have been uh, several simulations that they have taken and the simulations are to be much more, uh, uh, to say much more precise, they have taken uh, general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics effects right. into effect. So that, right. that actually plays a very important role. And here we haven't taken those into effect as of now, because right now we are just uh, uh, building up our um, benchmark test for uh, right. getting into that kind of work. So yeah, I mean, they have tested out several models. But right now we are just assuming that their model is correct and the pre-existing uh, results, independent of EHT observations, which have been done using electromagnetic uh, observations earlier. We are just taking that into effect and doing our work. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. The next question is from Shagnik Bhattacharji. How do rotating black holes have different means it's do rotating black holes have different shadow structures than non rotating ones? Yeah, I'm um, sorry, I actually sort of uh, skipped on that part very fast there because I was having time constraint. So, yes, actually, it happens to be so that in static black hole, we see a spherically symmetric um, structure like this because the space time is actually static and it's not rotating and hence there is no frame dragging effects and you can see how photon rays uh, how photons are actually just uh, going in and they're just plunging it into and those which are above those um, critical impact parameter they're just simply deflecting whereas when you talk about rotating rotating black hole here you see how uh, photons are actually behaving they're behaving in a very absurd way right this is due to the frame dragging effect and hence the shadow that we see, it is not actually spherically symmetric. It is somewhat very much distorted. And hence the uh, MAT7 image that we see, it is not exactly spherically symmetric. The, the reasons are, there are many, many reasons it's not spherically symmetric. That is um, our finite resolution, there's interstellar scattering, and there are a lot of lot, lots and lots of other stuff. But yeah, mainly it's that it's actually also rotating. And hence you can see the uh, redshift and blue shift of the accretion disk is also happening here. So yeah, they have different shadows. Okay, thank you. I think that answers his questions. So once again, thanks for the talk. The thank next so speaker much. is Manu Srivastava from IIT Bombay. His topic is quantum effects in black holes. So you can share your screen and start. Uh, okay, am I audible? Yeah, you are. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, so my talk is going to be about quantum effects in black holes. Uh, we, I worked with uh, Professor Shankarna in IIT Bombay on a paper titled Black Back Reaction of Matter Fluctuations in Asymptotically Non-Flat Black Hole Spacetime. And this talk is going to be about our work in that paper. So first of all, I'm glad that Saurabh's talk took place before mine. So I don't have to talk about black holes too much. Uh, just to reiterate that black holes are uh, objects with singularities covered with horizons. And they are characterized by three properties, their mass, charge, and angular momentum. And uh, in our study, what we do is uh, we take the charge and the angular momentum to be zero. And so the only parameter that only black hole parameter that we have in our problem is M and with that only M decides the size of the black hole also. So uh, how, when I say about uh, quantum effects in black holes, so Hawking radiation is one of the striking effects that is widely agreed to arise from introducing quantum effects in general relativity. And what happens is we introduce some quantum scalar fields in the black hole background metric and the result that comes out to be a thermal radiation coming out of black hole. So one of the key assumptions that goes into Hawking radiation calculation is that the field that we introduce, the quantum field that we introduced in the background black hole space time does not affect the background metric in, my, in any way. That is, uh, it is a free field propagating in a fixed classical background. So we, in our work, we try to uh, question this assumption. 
uh, what we see is that uh, what the result of our work is that there is a region around the black hole around near close to the event horizon where it this assumption that we can neglect the back reaction due to this quantum scalar field is no longer valid uh, we aim to calculate this length scale if you see the diagram uh, there is a bit around the event horizon where we say that the gravitational back reaction due to the scalar field uh, can no longer be neglected and therefore in this region hawking's assumption of free field propagating in a fixed classical background may break down whereas in the region outside here outside this region uh, we say that the back reaction is not much so uh, we consider only in our work we have considered uh, only spherically symmetric metrics the spherically symmetric black holes uh, where the line element is given by minus f of r dt square plus dr square by f of r and this is the spherically symmetric two sphere so most of our work uh, covers uh, most of our work is uh, valid for general spherically symmetric metric uh, which means for any general f of r but uh, for special cases of uh, sads by sads i mean short child uh, black hole in ads space time that is anti disitter space time and uh, for short child black hole in disitter space time we have explicitly calculated the results so these are black holes which are asymptotically non flat that is what the title meant as in asymptotically non flat black holes because going towards infinity these black holes uh, sads uh, asymptotically maps to the anti disitter space which has negative curvature and uh, the disitter space has positive curvature so just to mention that the sads metric where f of r is given by this quantity has only one real root so there will be only one horizon whereas uh, for the sds case there are two horizons and we our result is valid only for one of the horizons which is close to the black hole so horizon is by the way given by setting this f of r equals 0 so what we do is we study the effect of a quantum scalar actually we include only a mass plus scalar field using two approaches one is a statistical mechanics calculation and the other is a quantum field theoretic analysis so how do we include the quantum field is just as saurabh showed in his slides in the einstein's equation on the right hand side you have the stress energy tensor so we substitute the stress energy tensor of the scalar field in the einstein's equation and the einstein's equation turns out to be just the wave equation box y equals 0 now because our scenario the metric is spherically symmetric we can decompose this this phi in terms of spherical harmonics and in terms of the radial dependent part what we get is an equation which is a schrodinger like equation which is equation 7 with a certain potential so what i would like to just point out is that this potential is for the short child black hole case it's called the rejeweller potential and it looks something like this the on the x axis there is it is the radial distance a uh, radial distance scaled by the horizon radius and on the y axis it is the potential so the important thing to note is that there is this barrier here and if you see the barrier height increases with increases in value of l where l is the orbital angular momentum number so what happens is the higher our l value is the higher is this peak higher is the barrier so most of the high angular momentum modes what happens is they are trapped close to the horizon because for them the barrier is very high so most of the high angular momentum modes are trapped close to the horizon so coming back to this picture what happens is as i said that most of the angular high angular momentum modes are trapped close to the horizon so because they have high angular momentum they have a certain energy content and this energy content our work shows that this energy content is what will cause uh, the back reaction to the metric so in this region we claim that the back reaction will be strong whereas in the region outside the back reaction will be weak and our aim in this paper is to calculate what the width of this region is or at least how this width depends on black hole parameter m or black hole size rh so i said that we aim to calculate a length scale or this width so what we do we want this to be coordinate independent so we define the invariant distance just like the proper length which is dr by f of root f of r integral and just to note that this is from the horizon the integral goes from rh rh is the horizon radius to any a definite point r so this will be gamma will be something that we'll try to calculate at what gamma the inter the back reaction becomes strong so uh, 
so i'll first uh, i'll just go through the important ingredients of both the approaches the statistical mechanics approach and the uh, qft approach and then and finally i'll show the results so what happens is first what do we do is we calculate the relevant the energy of the relevant mode i said that there are a lot of high angular momentum modes here so they will have some energy content and so what we do is we first try to calculate what is the total energy due to this mode and from statistical mechanics then we know that once there is an average energy content there will be statistical fluctuations over that average so those statistical fluctuations we try to calculate using classical statistical mechanics then we show is that these statistical fluctuations cause a smearing of the horizon so this is one of the key results of our uh, work is that when we introduce a quantum field in the black hole space time the black hole space time that was initially static the black hole horizon that was initially fixed like for short shell black hole we have r equals 2m as a fixed radius that is no longer true once we include a quantum field then what happens is there it introduces a certain uncertainty in the black hole radius that is this if this is your event horizon classically by introducing a quantum field what will happen is this will become there will be a bit in this event horizon there will be a certain uncertainty so i'll not go into the details but uh, that is one of the results that we found and then we we go on to calculate this length scale that we want to calculate and how we do this in this statistical mechanics approach is that uh, we have the statistical fluctuations in energy so what this energy content will also cause some curvature so how do we we try to incorporate that by you by substituting this energy fluctuations in back in our wave, which is equation 7 so what happens is the wave equation changes a little because if this was the wave equation initially without any fluctuations and then there will be a wave equation with fluctuations and we see what is the difference between these two wave equations if that difference is large then we say that the back reaction is strong if the difference is weak we say that the back reaction is weak so we set that dip, whatever is the difference uh, we set that to be large to get this length scale in our statistical mechanics approach so calculate the length scale in this way in our statistical mechanics approach the next approach is the qft approach now here we shift the scenario a little what we consider is once we are talking about quantum field theory the modes the field modes are actually you can think of them like thermal particles or what we call the hawking particles so what we consider is apart from these hawking particles in the atmosphere by atmosphere i mean the region around the event horizon so apart from these hawking particles we we consider a massless point like particle falling inside the black hole this is not the hawking particle just some arbitrary massless part particle falling into the black hole and then we see that how this massless particle interacts with the hawking particle if the the point at which the interaction between the hawking particle and this massless particle starts becoming strong we claim that is the point at which the back reaction due to the hawking particles will become strong so what are the key steps so first of all we check what our metric the metric i showed in the beginning slides how does it look like uh, close to the horizon then there is an ingredient which a shock wave ingredient in our analysis uh, professor tooft and collaborators they showed that when we have a point like massless particle in minkowski space it can be modeled as a shock wave something called a shock wave so but uh, so uh, we also have a we have a massless point like particle but not in minkowski space we have it in black hole background so how do we use the shock wave analysis is that we show that any minkowski metric can mimic a near horizon metric so what the metric the near horizon metric that we evaluated in step 1 we show that a minkowski metric also under certain coordinate transformations looks exactly like this near horizon uh, metric Uh, so then what happens that okay mm, any analysis that uh, works for minkowski space we can extend that to the near horizon behavior so uh, the next step is what we try to calculate is the state the quantum state of uh, the thermal particle the hawking particle and then we calculate the probability see what happens is we are first we calculate the state before the thermal before the thermal particle interacts with this shock wave and then we calculate the state after interaction with the shock wave then we take the overlap of the two states and calculate the probability the probability that the thermal particle remains in the same state even after even after interaction with the shock wave the rationale is that if it remains in the same state if the probability to remain in the same state is large 
then it means that the interaction is weak the effect the, the incoming particle is not having much effect but if that this probability to remain in the same state becomes low then it means that the incoming particle is changing the state of the thermal particle in a considerable amount so the region we, we calculate the distance at which this probability to remain in the same state becomes small so using that Uh, using this probability analysis we calculate the length scale at which the interactions will become strong or uh, and when interactions are becoming strong it means the back reaction due to the field to the background metric is large so the results that we show using the two approaches for the sads case that is a short shell black hole in ads space time is here and for the ds space time is here so what you see is that uh, what is x axis is chi equals rh by l so going towards the right on the x axis we are increasing the black hole size and the y axis is just the critical distance the width that i showed that width calculation so what happens is that uh, we see that the two approaches when chi goes to zero it also means it is the limit in which l is going to infinity l is the ads length scale now once l is going to infinity it means our black hole if we are going to the short shell black hole limit. so in the short shell black hole case both the results are exactly matching whereas for the short shell black hole in ads space time for this we see that both the results match only very close to the very for small black hole for chi for rh by l very close to zero so but uh, what uh, the result see uh, we have made a lot of approximations in the analysis and our results are not accurate up to order 1 pre factor so the important thing to note is that both the analysis they predict the same order of magnitude so uh, even for the short shell black hole in disitter space uh, as i said that uh, in, in this region our analysis is not valid because in disitter space you have a lot of other physics going on in the short shell disitter case you actually have two horizons and this is the limit where chi goes to 1 by root 3 is the limit in which both the horizons merge and so these this part has a lot more physics that has to be accounted for but for the region the initial part of the graph you see again the order of magnitude is same predicted by both the approaches so this this is our uh, uh, the results that we get so the conclusions is the conclusions are that the first of all using uh, introducing a quantum effect a quantum scalar field in the black hole space time it causes the smearing of horizon so the it introduces a certain uncertainty in horizon rate the second thing is that the assumption the assumption used in hawking radiation calculation that there is a free field propagating in a fixed classical background that assumption is not valid at all, all length scales and we explicitly calculate what length scales it is valid and what it is not valid using two approaches which is a statistical mechanics approach and a quantum field theoretic approach and we see that for the short shell black hole it is exactly matching whereas for the short shell ads and short shell ds cases the two results are consistent exactly consistent for rh by l much less than 1 but the order of magnitude remains the same for all values of chi so these are the references and okay thank you okay thank you for your nice talk so we have a question from shagnik do mm -hmm. those high angular momentum modes comprise the black hole firewall Ah uh, yeah, this is yeah. The firewall concept is also similar. Means what the firewall concept is that uh, because of this uh, high angular momentum mode that we have close to the black hole, what this see what happens is uh, there is this uh, trans Planckian problem. Usually in Hawking radiation, what happens is that uh, when you see outside, you have some finite frequency of the radiation, you have some finite energy, but as you start tracing back towards the horizon, what happens is there is a blue shift happening. okay so so very close to the horizon these modes become very high energy modes but where did this energy come from and these energy finally tracing back to the horizon they say that it it leads to trans planckian modes means even the length scale of the fluctuations become smaller than the planck length which is not till now not understood that something can go below the planck length so this is what the trans planckian problem is so so one proposal to solve this problem is that they introduce a firewall just outside the horizon they assume that there is a very high energy density wall and no particle can be traced back beyond that so that firewall the origin of that firewall you are right exactly is the high angular momentum modes close to the horizon 
Okay, thanks. So I have a question. So when mm-hmm. you are talking about ADS or DS space times, mm-hmm. so are the asymptotic states unique? Ah, asymptotic states. Oh, the space times are unique, right? In yes, the space uh, if times I... are unique, but it's mm-hmm. not flat. So how do you exactly define the asymptotic states? No, so but I don't. I mean, that what I'm what we are considering are, is the metric. We are considering the state only close to the horizon. The asymptotic states are uh, means you are. I think you are asking about the vacuum states in curved space time. Yeah, there yeah. are different vacuum states for different. Yeah, so yeah, the exactly. thing, yeah. So what happens it means any you take one vacuum state and you start evolving things because we are not comparing the things. We are not mixing SADS with SDS. You choose for the ADS case, you choose any one vacuum state, and then you can have a fix. You can have analysis for SADS case. Whereas for the DS case, you you can choose any other. So the, we are not mixing these two things. So I think there is no problem with the definition of vacuum states being different. Okay, thanks. So we have another question from Shopa. No, so you can unmute yourself and ask. Yeah. Uh, hi. So I had a question. Basically, uh, I mean, I'm a little confused at that part. You said that in particular, in you know, QFT approach. So mm-hmm. the incoming particle is interacting with the thermal background, right? But uh, exactly. I mean, uh, this thermal background, uh, yeah. So, uh, but uh, I mean, a free falling particle wouldn't notice this thermal background, right? I mean, I mean, someone standing at infinity would actually observe uh, it to interact with this thermal background, isn't isn't mm-hmm. that the case? I mean, because a free falling see, particle doesn't notice uh, Hawking radiation. No, no. See, when you say free falling, you say that in the background metric it is free falling. That is, the, it is free falling in the sense. What I meant is only a massless particle. See what I in this point two, which I say, the yes, the yes. Uh, Tuft and uh, collaborators what they showed is that if you have a massless particle propagating in a mm-hmm. Minkowski space, so how it changes the metric is by a shock wave. If I can go into the details and it, see what happens is the metric you see the Minkowski metric. If you didn't have this term, it would just be the Minkowski metric du dv and dx square dy square. But once you have that what is the effect of that uh, free uh, the, of the massless particle is this part in the uh, metric so it's not that uh, even a massless particle will change the metric in this way and this is what they call the shock wave why they call it the shock wave is you see that this is ha- this is non zero only for a particular value of u so it's like a wave of in of a very high energy density only for u equals u not and everywhere else it is just plain minkowski so this shock wave interacts with the what uh, i mean is that this shock wave interacts with the thermal part okay okay so uh, i mean uh, so that means it has not yeah okay okay so like it has nothing to do with uh, what one observes as uh, mm, yeah, yeah exactly okay, mm-hmm. okay okay yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you thank you okay so thank you thanks manu for the talk so the next thank you so much so the next talk is by shoptoshi vishash from aizer kolkata his topic is emergence of geometric phase shift in planar non commutative quantum mechanics so shoptoshi you can share your screen and start yeah. is it uh, is it no it has not come yet Yeah, yeah, it's visible now. I guess it's not properly yes. synchronized. Okay, you just share it once again. I have shared it once. So, is it now visible? Yeah, so it's loading. So, just wait. Let's wait for something. Okay, it will come. Yeah, yeah, it is now visible. so you can start so hello i am shaktor shivishal from iler kolkata i am a phd student there presently at my fifth year so i underwent this work in um, last summer vacation as a project student at um, at kesan bosch uh, kolkata and my supervisor says well as Collaborators during this work were Mr. 
partner and the other person to be portable at the same time. So the uh, topic of my today's talk is as it is taken as uh, emergence of geometric phase shift in planet non so the, uh, before uh, diving into the exact uh, model that we analyze uh, yeah, we first uh, we will take a example of why non-positivity is uh, uh, important. So the idea of non-positivity can be traced back to the simple thought experiment. Hello, Shaptarshi, are you there? Um, I think he has disconnected. Yeah. Yes, he is. Yeah, yeah Shaptarshi, you can continue. So, hi, Shaptoshi, are you here? Hi. So, Shaptoshi, please unmute yourself. Hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, now you can continue. My screen is it um, Is my screen is visible? Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Hello. Yeah, yeah, you can start. We can see your screen. And am I being audible? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Hmm. So, yeah. Uh, hello, I am Shakar Subhisha from Aizar Kolkata. I am a PhD student there, uh, presently in my fifth year. So I underwent this work while I was at SMU Kolkata uh, during my last summer vacation uh, as a PhD student there. And my supervisors, as well as collaborators during this work, and also usually Dr. Gupta at SMUs Kolkata. So the topic of my work as it is written here is emergence of geometric phase between planar non-commutative quantum mechanics. So before diving into the exact model that we analyze in this work, we first give a brief motivation about why uh, non-commutativity is important. So the idea of non-commutativity can be traced back from a very simple thought experiment which I described here in a very nice way. And I actually myself also is not very aware of the exact mathematical uh, detail. Thing. So the idea is I think he has been disconnected again. Uh, okay, so I think let's go to the next talk. So that will give him some time to, so that he can try to fix his connections. So is it okay? So is he here? Hello, so hello, Shaptoshi, can you hear me? Yeah. So yeah, do you want yeah, me I to think, share your screen so that? Yeah, that I think would be better. And also sometimes the uh, microphone is getting muted from time to time. Okay, so I am sharing your slides. So you can stop sharing now. So I'm sharing. So, 
No way. Yeah, so can you see? Yeah, yeah, I can see. So, so there is that one? Yeah, yes, sir. So, uh, so hello, I am Sakra Shilishar from Aizar, Kolkata, and the SMS for India, which is a And uh, this work, I uh, underwent uh, last year during my summer vacation as a project student at Istanbul and my uh, supervisors as well as collaborators during that work, uh, during this work by Mr. Bartholomew and Dr. Bartholomew at Istanbul. So the topic of my talk as it is uh, written here, please. Um, emergence of geometry spaceship in planar non commutative quantum mechanics. So, the, uh, before diving into the precise model that we analyze for this work, we we'll first give a brief uh, motivation about why uh, non commutativity is important. So, the idea of non commutativity can be traced to a very simple thought experiment. And I Describe it very nicely in my work. So the idea is that if one wants to throw, uh, if one wants to throw uh, at the plane scale of Planck's constant, then from Heisenberg's uncertainty, he would need to pump in a very huge amount of energy in a very small volume. And from here, it is uh, known that energy can be acted as a source of gravity. So we such a huge amount of energy acting with a very small volume, it could uh, contribute uh, for a large source of gravity and that could even uh, depart the space time locally, uh, introducing further uncertainty in the position. So the whole uh, uh, measurement process that was they uh, have to do uh, completely fall down. So this uh, dilemma or fallacy was circumvented by this person with our professor in, in um, one of their work by uh, saying that as uh, Hello. Uh, yeah, hello. Yeah, yeah, continue. So, the idea of the official is all first that uh, is uh, there is a uh, certain minimum pain scale of space time itself uh, beyond which measurement is not possible. And this thing was attributed to certain kind of non commutativity among the spatial temporal coordinates themselves. And uh, due to this inherent fuzziness uh, of this time, the, uh, the, the problem of uh, gravitational collapse in between uh, measurement processing in a small time scale was uh, circumvented. And so this was called the uh, spatial temporal non commutativity Now uh, it is also proposed that there can be non commutativity among uh, momentum components as well. The motivation behind that was in one way, the uh, fundamental point of view was that to maintain both statistics in spatial uh, 
and uh, those statistics and from there those kind strain condensation in non rotated uh, space one who also need to introduce some computer uh, momentum components so that was one motivation behind non probability unknown uh, momentum coordinates and apart from that as effective theories in condensed matter system one can also have uh, uh, effectively non commutativity between uh, momentum components so in a uh, landau level type of problem when a planar system is subjected to a perpendicular Hello. Hello. Yeah, you are. Please continue. And also notify me when I have to change your slides. Okay. Yeah, so uh, you can go to the next slide. The next slide. Okay. Yeah. So the I the motivation behind uh, uh, non commutativity between momentum components can be traced back in one way the uh, Fundamental point of view was that to maintain both Einstein condensation in non commutative space, one also needs to incorporate non commutativity among uh, momentum components. So that was one uh, uh, motivation from fundamental uh, theoretical part. And apart from that, as effective theory in condensation system, if one considers a land level types of problem where the a planar system is subjected to a perpendicular magnetic field, there one has the infinity momenta uh, being uh, different from the uh, being different from the canonical uh, momentum and so there one says that there is certain non-trivial non-commutativity between the infinity momenta component. So the whole problem of the planar system in a perpendicular magnetic field can also be effectively treated as a planar system without any external magnetic field, but only a non-trivial non-commutativity between the kinetic momenta. So that uh, a, uh, uh, Effective theoretical point of view for introducing non commutative uh, momentum components. So, having said about this motivation about um, non commutativity in the phases uh, variable, there has been a great deal of interest among scientific community to find what such uh, modifications within the basic, the fundamental computational position who have in the uh, mathematical foundation of. Uh, quantum mechanics and what are the deviations that can lead us to from um, the uh, predictions of ordinary mechanics. So in this regard, uh, study the famous uh, concept of deviations in a quantum system within an ambient uh, non commutative system where both a spatial and uh, momentum uh, non commutativity are taken into account. So you can uh, go to the next slide. Yeah, so the uh, modular study is basically a simple 2D harmonic oscillator uh, system where the uh, mass and frequency uh, parameters are time dependent, they vary adiabatically with time, and the adiabatic approximation that we take are basically the dot uh, 
and almost equal to epsilon and the higher uh, derivatives goes uh, goes even smaller and this is the uh, basic identity approximation we take in our system and r t is a point in the parameter space uh, where t t and t t are two parameters of our uh, uh, model I mean, uh, next slide so uh, uh, before going into the website calculation of the usage will first give a brief interest of the concept of geometric space. So in quantum mechanics, the idea is that if a quantum system is transported to a uh, additive cycle, where the system doesn't have any uh, level uh, crossing the energy levels of the system doesn't cross to each other while undergoing the additive uh, transport. Then, if the system starts from an energy eigenstate, then after the whole uh, additive transport to a periodic cycle, uh, the system again uh, returns back to the initial state of the system with an additional phase factor. And now this phase factor has an have uh, two parts, one is dynamical part which depends on the uh, uh, dynamics along the trajectory in the parameter space that the system do and a geometry uh, part which only depends on the geometry of the trajectory and not on the dynamics and the geometry of the part is called the periphery. Now in classical mechanics there is also an analogous um, uh, quantity. So if one considers a periodic classical system taken to a adequate uh, time evolution and then uh, 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 return to its original uh, uh, point in uh, parameter space, then uh, uh, the Corresponding action and angle variables of the system satisfies a additive theorem that is, the action variable doesn't um, change after the whole uh, additive transport and the angle variable add up an additional term. Uh, so you have a few minutes, okay. Of course, one is a dynamical part and another is a geometry part. So, next slide. Yeah. So, in ordinary quantum mechanics, if we study the uh, two dimensional ion oscillator, there are only in geometry space, only the dynamical space will be there. And this is the basic uh, way of uh, sh uh, sh uh, showing that it will also be uh, very clear after the end of this talk. So, next slide. So, now we consider non commutative phase space where the first one and the non commutative uh, uh, position that we take. And to calculate the non commutative phase space, one can introduce certain non canonical transformations which expresses the non commutative coordinates in terms of commutative uh, coordinates and then can utilize the results of ordinary quantum mechanics as well. But only caveat is that uh, it is only valid calculating uh, quantities which are representation independent of the system. So, uh, next slide. Hello. So, with this non canonical uh, transformation, the Hamiltonian that we do would look like this uh, when expressed with the uh, uh, commuting coordinates and the alpha, beta, gamma, delta enforce the time dependent uh, parameters as well as the non commutative parameters of the system. Next slide. So the uh, 
this hematoma can be diagnosed in terms of this ladder uh, uh, operator case uh, personal case can be easily derived from the ordinary harmonic oscillator like ladder uh, operator after incorporating suitable locally work like transformation because hematoma was in the bilinear form. Uh, next slide. So now we solve the uh, Heisenberg question of motion of this um, data operator and not take the uh, more conventional path of actually basis to respect the different independentness of non competitive system. So the Heisenberg equation of motion of the data operator looks like this, and here a key point is that as the Adaptive to parameters vary very slowly with time. So, in analogy to WKB approximation, we can also uh, utilize the uh, same kind of WKB approximation here to the uh, little difference is that here we have certain complex term within the analogous to potential, and here we have the independent parameters with only time. So, next one. Yes. Yeah. So after doing the WKB approximation, we find the ladder uh, operator after evolving to only have certain phase uh, factors being accumulated with the ladder um, operator. And within this phase factor, we easily identify the geometric part. That is the very phase, and this very phase, when expressed in terms of the original uh, time given the parameters of the system and the non quantity parameters, looks like this. So, therefore, we say that if we don't have a spatial or a moment of non quantity, that is either theta is zero, then the geometric phase vanishes. So, we only have the uh, uh, non trivial very phase when there is non competitivity among all the phase phase uh, variables. Okay, Shoptoshi, we are badly running out of time, so it would be great if you wrap it up in 40 seconds or so. Okay. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, okay, continue. So now, having found the predictors uh, of the corresponding bond of the system, also find the uh, corresponding geometric phase in the corresponding classical system. So, we find that using a semi classical approach, we, can, we start with a certain uh, state of this uh, system with based approximates the initial conditions of the classical system, and as we know, the coil states are expressed in, in terms of energy eigenstates of the system, and we have found the base phases of those energy eigenstates. So, we can evolve the coherent state um, um, to the corresponding uh, adaptive periodic time version of the system, and we find that. Uh, the uh, coherence state transforms to a, another coherence state, and here the uh, key point is that we have certain operators which are analogous to the classical action and angle uh, variables. So, this i i and u i are the proxy for the action and angle operator. That is, they are suitable when uh, the semi classical approximations are constant, and after this. Uh, adaptive time evolution we find in the new coherent state from the uh, phase of the complex parameters of the new coherent state, we can easily read out the NS angle, the geometric phase that the angle variable uh, uh, takes up after the time evolution. And this uh, geometric phase is exactly the same as we found for the later uh, Next slide. Yeah. So, uh, having found this non trivial geometric phases for non trivial space, we can ask what, or what is the basic difference of non trivial space from commutative to space that leads us to this non trivial geometric phase. So, the basic idea is that the non commutative phase variables are not uh, 
simply the antibodies are symmetric or anti-symmetric, unlike the commutative ones, and hence the effective Hamiltonian that is found in the number of states is also not antibodies are symmetric. And it is uh, shown that a Hamiltonian can only furnish geometric space if it breaks a uh, uh, time symmetry. So the time water symmetry breaking effect of non-boundary space basically leads to uh, uh, so this non-trivial geometry. So yeah, uh, this was actually what I wanted to say. Yeah, this was the uh, I Okay. Thank you, Shaptoshi, for your nice talk. So we are running very late and I don't see any questions uh, so far. So if you have any questions, you can directly ask the speaker privately. So we can move forward to our next talk. The next speaker is Sreshtha Bishash from IIT Kanpur. She will talk about introducing coherence in radial degrees of freedom. So, Sreshtha, you can share your screen and proceed. Is my screen visible? Yeah, it's visible. So, hello everyone. So, today I am talking about introducing coherence in radial degree of freedom. This is the work I have done as a part of my MSc project with affiliation to IIT Kanpur under the supervision of Dr. Anand Kumar Shah. So the first question is, what coherence we are uh, questioning here? The answer is, this is the optical coherence between different different points. So we know the optical sources are generally random. So this is a very crude kind of picture of young double slit experiment to remind everyone of that. So this is the optical source that is emitting light and we have placed a double slit in front of it. So if the light from this point and this point uh, are coherent enough, then they're producing an interference pattern on the screen. Now, depending on the coherence of these two points, the interference fringe changes. So this is for a certain coherence uh, of these two points. Now, if the coherence between these two points diminishes, the intensity pattern also changes. So we know there are a lot of applications of these coherence functions in time and spatial degrees of freedom. So today, my interest will be on radial degrees of freedom. So the first question is why radial? The thing is, the radial space is semi-infinite. That is, it extends from zero to infinite. So although we know that we have certain beams with radial symmetry and they have certain applications, there are not enough researchers involved in these coherence functions in radial degree freedom. So we have fundamental interest to understand that. The second thing is, we have this, this whole class of log Gaussian modes, which have discretized radial mode indices, P, as well as discretized azimuthal mode indices L. So these azimuthal mode indices have already been used in the uh, fields of quantum communication, quantum information, and now our aim is to use the radial mode index P, or mode indices, the entire basis, P index, P index basis, in the field of quantum information. And the third thing is, if we have a control over the radial structure of our beam, then we can do certain kinds of particle trapping and can have advantages in imaging uh, with some radial symmetry, radially symmetric objects. So to start off, what is the definition of radial cross-spectral density that I'm going to talk about? The thing is, let us take a point, R1 theta1 of an optical beam and another point R2 theta2 on the same optical beam. Now the electric field at these two points, R1 theta 1 and R2 theta 2, time ensemble or time average over that is called the cross spectral density in cylindrical coordinates W R1 theta 1, R2 theta 2. Now to take advantage of the radial symmetry, we choose another point at point R2 theta 1. That is, these two points are of same angular location but of different radial location. 
After getting this W R one theta one R two theta one, we numerically integrate over our azimuthal space theta one and obtain W R one R two. This is kind of a partial tracing to get the radial information extracted out from the optical beam. Now let us suppose that our electric beam is such that, with obviously radial symmetry, is such that it can be expressed as uh, it can be expressed as a functional uh, summation over the radial modes. That f and r are my radial modes, and alpha in is the uh, weighted of f and r modes. Then this W R one R two takes this kind of a form, sum over n m and lambda n m. Where this lambda n m is the cross correlation between different radial modes f n or f m. Now we are going to show that this lambda n m can be evaluated from W R one R two from inverse transformation. So let us first take this f n r as e to the power i p r by root r. This is the radial momentum eigen mode where p r is the radial momentum. So, incurrently adding or adding the different f and r modes, we get W R one R two as this. And using the orthonormality relations for this kind of mode, which is basically the uh, Fourier transformation, we get the expression for S P R Q R like this. So, we are basically multiplying this factor over here and here, and then integrating over R one and R two to get this to get this out from W R one R two. Similarly, here we are taking F and R as the lower Gaussian mode that I have introduced in the very first slide. For that, if we uh, if various lower Gaussian modes are added with same azimuthal mode index L, but different p indices p and q, and with different weightages, then we get cross-sectional density, radial cross-sectional density with this kind of an representation. And for that, again using the orthonormal relation of lower Gaussian p mode, we get S P Q of this form. Now, if this lambda n m, that is the cross correlation between different radial modes, is absent, if all the modes are completely incoherent, then we can have the coherent mode representation of W R one R two like this. In this case, this beta n is called the spectrum, like beta n as a function of n is called the spectrum function, which is the weightage of Uh, each coherent superposed mode f and r, f and star r. So we can also evaluate this beta n from W R one R two, as you can understand from inverse transformation. So now, if we have an unknown incoming field coming in, and if we know the W R one R two of that, we can understand what are the radial momentum contents of that, or we can understand what are the lower Gaussian p mode contents of that by doing this inverse transformation. So the entire problem. Of detection of this PR, the radial momentum, or the lower Gaussian p mode, boils down to the evaluation of W R one R two. Now, for that, we have devised the radial interferometer. So we have the source, we have the beam splitter, which which splits the light into two. Now we are placing two mirrors in one arm, and similarly to other mirrors in the other arm, one more beam splitter, such that light from these two arms recombines, and we detect the Overlap pattern on the CCD or EM50 camera. That is our detector. But now here we require interference of two points that are of same azimuthal location but of different radial location. So for that we introduce two lenses in one of the arms. So let us call this as arm one. So uh, two lenses of uh, focal length f1 and f2. Hence when the light beam light beam comes in and split it into two. In the first arm, it gets magnified. So, if f2 by f1 is m, then this light beam gets magnified by a factor of m. But this lens does not only this lens does not only produces this magnification, but they are also inverting the beam. So, as you can see over here, the a point is going to a over here. So, there is an inversion to this to this in the transverse plane. So, and there will be one more uh, inversion similar. To the plane that is uh, normal to the plane of your screen, so there will be two trans uh, two inversions in the transverse plane: one x to minus x, one y to minus y. So uh, that will change a point on location theta to theta plus pi. To to account for that, we introduce two more dust prisms in the other arm, such that the beam in this arm gets also inverted by the same amount x to minus x and y to minus. Such that when they fall on the detector camera, there is no angular tilt between them. Now we have this radial interferometer. 
and let us see let us understand that this is the original beam now at this point this is the information content of the uh, this is the information content of point r and this is the information content of point r by m the electric field at point r by m now in the second the first arm that is without any magnifier this thing is just being copied so the electric field at r is go, goes to an electric field at r but in the first arm that is con that contains a magnifier uh, of magnifier combination of lenses the point at r is uh, is going to a point at mr and a point at r by m is going to a point at r hence on the detector plane when these two beams are interfering with each other the uh, the information that are contained at point r and at point r by m of the original beam is overlapping on each other in this overlapping region hence the uh, electric field on the overlapping region on the detector camera is expressed as the electric field due to the first arm at point r by m comma theta and the electric field due to the first arm at point r comma theta now we get the expression for intensity on the detector plane this is the this is the intensity coming due to the first arm this is the intensity due to the second arm and here comes the cross correlation term that we are interested in and here is a factor delta this is the phase difference of light beam in this two parts so by tweaking the parameter delta to 0 and pi we can get information about the real part of wr comma r by m comma theta and similarly changing it to pi by 2 and 3 pi by 2 we can get information about the imaginary part of it so to introduce this del phase between these two arms of the interferometer we are introducing this geometric phase this could be a wave plate we might put a transition stage over here but we need to introduce this a different del between different phase differences in this two arm so when this wr comma r by m comma theta is on our plane we just numerically integrate it over theta and get wr comma r by m now repeating this same process with 5 6 m values we can reconstruct our wr1 r2 the total two dimensional uh, wr1 r2 function i am not going into the details of the reconstruction so let us just understand the applic one application of this radial interferometer so this is a process spontaneous parametric down conversion that can produce entangled photons so if we have a nonlinear crystal and a photon beam is incidenting on it then it can produce two photons like one photon is producing two photons that are entangled in the spatial in the spatial as well as their uh, energy or the frequency region but we are only concentrating on their entanglement of them in the spatial region so if one you have is, two more minutes okay okay sure so if one photon is at r theta location another photon will be at r minus theta location as the radial and azimuthal positions are entangled there the biphoton wave function that is the combined wave functions of these two photons have the split decomposed form in lg lp basis and you can see if one photon has in uh, mode indices p and l then another photon will have mode indices p and minus l so they are entangled in their radial as well as azimuthal mode indices as well so if we can evaluate the lambda lp we can understand the radial as well as oa mode content of these entangled photons Uh, by changing the photon beam the, the photon pump over here we can change the lambda lp as well and hence we can know how to you know, how to use this entangled photon in quantum information that will be obviously high dimensional quantum information so we are interested in evaluating lambda lp and with a 3 4 page long calculation we get this expression for lambda lp so here are a lot of terms but the main term of inter, uh, interest is this one wr1 comma theta r2 comma minus theta so what we need to do is that after getting this uh, entangled photons we choose one of uh, we choose to locate one of these uh, photon beams and uh, using the same radial interferometer just we use uh, two uh, dust prisms over there we will use one dust prism and remove another then we can uh, get this wr1 comma theta r2 comma minus theta of one of these entangled photons and after getting this quantity wr1 theta r2 minus theta by doing this reconstruction uh, we need a long code for it so after doing this reconstruction we get lambda lp 
So there are a lot of researches that are going on and are, have also been produced that they are, uh, evaluate some over C lambda LP or they evaluate lambda LP for specific C values. But as a base of my knowledge, there is no evaluation of 2D Smith, like 2D Smith spectrum uh, as of now. So we are basically interested to evaluate this two-dimensional uh, lambda LP for, ex uh, like, we want to do it experimentally, we want to measure it experimentally. That is our future plan. So the conclusions are the radial interferometer that I have shown that the, the interferometer is not using any radial state. So there is no masking of the input. So we are not masking any part of the input. So the intensity is not being diminished. Hence, we can use this radial interferometer in a classical light level as well as in the quantum light level. So you can use this radial interferometer to detect our SPDC photons that can have a very small photon star. The second thing is this WR1R2. If, we, uh, if there is an unknown beam, as I've mentioned, and I know the WR1R2, I can detect the P mode content of it or the radial momentum mode content of it. So it can be used as a radial mode detector. And the third thing is, as I've mentioned, if we know WR1 theta R2 minus theta, we can get the biphoton 2D spectrum. So at this point, I would like to thank Dr. Anand Kumar Shah, my supervisor, and Abhinandan Satyati, my collaborator, for their immense support. Thank you for your attention. So, Thanks for the nice talk. So questions. Uh, okay, so I have a question. So yeah. is there any basic reason to use LGLP basis? Means can't you do the same thing in Bessel modes? Uh, the problem with Bessel mode is, uh, like if we add z equals to zero location, we start let's say with a Bessel mode, but after uh, going like after traversing some distance, this Bessel mode is like it changes its functional form. It doesn't remain Bessel mode. But the Lagrangian modes are eigen function of this uh, equation that uh, that that look like that says about the um, how the beam should transfer from one point to another point. So if I start with LG PL mode at Z equals to zero location and it traverses some distance, it remains LG PL. So you don't need to uh, take account what distance you are going, what distance you are going to measure it. So that is the best part of using LG mode. But uh, the thing is for the SPDC photons, this is the uh, mean decomposed form. You cannot have basal mode here because uh, this is a unique expression for the cylindrical mode. So you cannot have Basal modes over here because this is a Smith decomposition form. You might check this paper. They have the full expression how they get this uh, decomposition. Okay, so I understand. So thank you for for your talk. We don't have any more questions right now. Thanks. And so let's thank all the speakers of the session and all the speakers of the day. So now uh, let's move on to the next session and I hand it over to Moitsu. Okay, thanks to all the speakers for the wonderful talks and thanks also to everyone for attending. So today we have one more session, the symposium session on condensed matter and materials physics and we will start it after a five minute break or so. But before that, uh, one of our main organizers, Nobunita Dutch has something to say. So I will hand it over to her. Now, Monika, go ahead. Thank you, Moitra. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you are audible. Yeah. So uh, we all know that since lockdown has begun, there have been several webinars organizing in every institute on every subject. So presidency physics students have come up with a brilliant idea of such a webinar. So every Wednesday, we organize a colloquium level talk by our alumni, by recent alumni who are just now PhD students at various institutes around the world. So uh, there have been nine talks so far and all the talks have been uploaded in the YouTube channel of Precision. Please go and uh, please go and check out those talks. And we also have, we will, uh, we will have talks again. So all the talks will be uploaded. So follow our YouTube channel and um, stay with us. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Di. So we will have the 
CMP and materials physics session after five or six minutes. Um, so uh, that, thank you.